Hi everyone. If this is your first time attending a webinar with RankSense, welcome. If it's not your first time, then welcome back. Today we're joined by Danielle Rowe, who is the Senior Marketing Strategist at Upbuild, and she's going to demonstrate ways to analyze the interesting finds feature with Selenium. So without further ado, let's get started. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Daniel, to, to join us today. How is it going in Cincinnati, right? Yes, just outside of Cincinnati. Um, we have a really nice day today, so nice and sunny and bright. Awesome. So it's looking nice as well here in New Jersey. Um, yes, yeah, so really excited to have you here joining. Um, and uh, really interesting uh, tutorial. We had some great questions and feedback from when we posted it yesterday. And um, yeah, this is this is this is awesome. You know, looking forward to sharing your expertise today here. Yeah, I'm excited to share it. Absolutely. So why don't we start with your story, right? So let's talk a little bit about your your background, your SEO background, where you come from, um, in the different roles you're, you've been through, and then we talk a little bit about also about your part, your Python journey. Yeah, um, I really got started in more of the marketing background. Um, I studied public relations in college and then worked in um, radio sales where I um, helped build coupon websites for some, they were like, it was during the recession. So they were adding in like these half price deals. So that's where I kind of started dabbling in um, encoding a bit because we had to add in like Google maps to show like how to get to these locations of these local real re retailers and like um, program in their offers for their coupons. And then, um, I uh, went on to move into a creative ad agency where I was doing mostly mostly project management, which wasn't really my, uh, I didn't really enjoy it that much. And we had a team of developers there and they were like, you know, if you're really into gaming, which I am, they're like, why don't you learn more about coding? Like, don't you want to learn how you can build like your own games and things? Um, so I started doing uh some, a small organization, it isn't really around anymore, for women to learn how to code. Um, so I took pretty much every course that they had and just kind of did all of that on the side, a lot of web development. So um, HTML, CSS, a little bit of PHP, and then JavaScript. And um, just on the side with all my marketing roles, I always like built things for web um, and also helped teach some of those courses. Uh, after working with that organization for about four years, probably, I thought I would pivot into, um, actually doing web development full time. So I found a job where I did, um, support for client websites as for software as a service client website provider, and then moved into a front end development uh, position with them. It was mostly just, um, HTML, CSS, jQuery and got poached by a digital consultancy to um, do more like advanced. So React and Angular. Um, the, actually the consultancy's uh, head of the dev team was like passed on me for doing that. But the marketing team brought me in to do SEO and analytics. And, and then the salespeople ended up getting me an interview um, with Kroger grocery retailer um, to do development work. And uh, they hired me on, even though the, the the consultancy guy said, hey, you don't have enough vanilla JS, so we're gonna pass. So I worked there at Kroger as an Angular React developer for about almost a year. Um, I really didn't enjoy like just being told, here, build this, like, but why? Why should I be building this? I came from the marketing background. I wanted to know like, what are we serving our customers? How are we, like, what is the purpose of this, right? So um, got back into SEO, moved on. Um, well, I did a little bit of analytics um, implementation for Kroger too for about a year and a half and then moved um, back into the SEO world for an e-commerce company. So I was there for a little over two years and now I'm at Upbuild. Um, so this is my first agency 
gig, and I'm really excited about that and working with um, lots of different clients. So that's that's where I am today, and that's where I have um, started okay. like the development interest. But really, I didn't start with Python until I started with Upbuild just just over a year ago. So. Wow, that's really that's really awesome. Um, yeah, and and uh, so how how long were you doing JavaScript for? How long were you because that obviously helped you a lot, right? Transitioning from from that, right? Yes, definitely. Um, so when I was at the when I was doing like mostly marketing roles, I did very limited JavaScript. Um, and then when we moved and I was a front end developer for the software as a service company, a lot of our development was already built, baked into the, the software tools. So um, more on the back end. So we just did jQuery really to help design pages and things. So it really wasn't until I would say that I was at Kroger, like forced into the Kroger role that I was really doing. And we were learning. Um, so Angular 2 had just been released. This is in 2014. 14, 2015. Wow, um, wow. So we were just all learning together, which made that like accessible. Like I could make it work because we were all learning together React and Redux and Angular um, and ES6. Like all of that was pretty new at the time. So only made it work because everybody else was in the same boat as me, like learning how to, to do it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And, and I'm enjoying these conversations with, you know, SEOs that approach come to, to program in Python and SEO from different backgrounds. This is really, really fascinating and interesting. And, and um, how did this, let's talk about how this tech, because you, you started coding before you did SEO, if I understand correctly, right? So how do you think that helped you, especially you ended up in technical SEO, obviously, right? Because it's the, it's the big connection, but you're training in marketing. I, I will assume that you felt like you, to find your ideal role, right? Your dream yeah. role, right? Where you're doing your, you're, you're, you're able to connect all your, your create creative. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, a lot of people say, um, you know, SEO has like, it's very strategic and it's also, it also can be quite technical. So yes, so I get to both of the, those worlds, like where when I was doing development, it was pretty much just like, you have to build this. And I'm not involved in any of the reason of why we're building it. Um, why are we, what problems are we solving? What are we trying to help our customers with? So I didn't like that aspect of it. So now that I am like helping to find the issues and like come up with the solutions for that, that's like the perfect like mix of things. And I also get to still tap into like the marketing side and do copywriting and things like that and, and use my creative thought, uh, thinking there as well, not just logical, right? Exactly. But as you mentioned, you didn't want to be a developer, right? You didn't want to be a front-end developer. No, not why, full time, why no. <laughs> yeah, why was that? Why do you, you didn't enjoy that specifically? Yeah, just um, it. I, I like don't want to offend anybody, but some of the people that I worked with would say that we were just coder monkeys is what they would say. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, we'd just be given uh, something to build and with no explanation of why. And like, you're just expected to build it, right? Like just mm -hmm. output, like no, no, like thought into why. Assembly line type of work, right? Mm -hmm. so you didn't want to be in that. Yeah. Role, that and it might not be the case everywhere, but that was such a large corporation Mm -hmm. that that's probably wh why that that was the case there um so yeah the larger the companies um uh, things t tend to be very monotonous you know mm -hmm. and i can relate because uh, out of college that was my first uh job you know working as a system administrator at a large isp company and i and that was the part that I didn't enjoy. It. And I actually, you know, ultimately, I, you know, that's what I started, you know, doing businesses myself because I love the challenge of being able to do whatever I want to focus on and not be tied to only following a specific path. So I can completely understand. And it's, there are needed different people in the world, right? So there are people that want the stability of just being doing the same thing over and over and they're fine with that. And there are other people that are more, hey, look, I want to, I need to be seeing changes. I need to be, and we need everybody, right? So mm -hmm. not need to be offended. Yeah. So yeah, and how did this technical knowledge, right? You think how that empowered you to do your job as an SEO, as a technical SEO? 
Yeah, um, I'm, I feel like I definitely have an advantage having worked in, you know, single page applications, um, mm -hmm. because that's something that I feel like a lot of SEOs are still kind of struggling to understand that concept. Yeah. So um, having built some stuff in that, like, I think I, that gives me a better understanding having made some mistakes with those and, and um, SEO, like, like and not getting React Helmet to work properly, uh, thanks to proxy servers and things like that. Like, um, no, learning from those mistakes has been really helpful, I would say, in that aspect. Um, and then, and like, being... clients, yeah, many of your clients at uh, Adobe are, are use uh, single page applications, are. We have had a few, or they might not completely be in a single page application. They, they might just be using certain like modules for that are ang like angular and so still understanding how to how that's going to impact those portions yeah. of the website right yeah i know that 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 makes sense yeah that's the cool thing about you know especially for one reactor you can do it incrementally you can start with a traditional application and incrementally add reactivity to the app so that's that's really cool Mm -hmm. that you can do that yeah and and and, and um i've been you know and different members in the community have been pushing seo said look yes this is valuable not everybody needs to really learn how to code but there is a very strong value from you understanding so that your instructions are not generic and where the developers have to try to dig in you know try to translate what you're saying into the changes that they have to actually do in the code but you can actually provide them, hey, look, this is how you should do it. And when they do it also, verify that it's working correctly or that they, you know, it, it's very valuable. And it's in terms of also prioritization, because if you don't, if you're a little bit ambiguous, this is providing pre precise information, they are able to execute a lot faster and prioritize what you have because it's less work for them that you to try to figure out how to, how to implement it, right? Yes, absolutely. And I would even say on the other side of it too, is it helps with like, most of the time your point of contact is not the developer, right? Like you're kind of having to work with um, somebody the project, who the project is manager, liaising. The so it's good manager. to be able to explain it to them a little mm -hmm. in, in terms they can understand too. Exactly. Yeah, I know that. That makes sense. And let's say that in our audience, you know, there are people that are trying to decide, hey, look, you know, you come from a JavaScript background, you learn Python, as we're going to see now. What would you recommend to them, right? And then there, there is, you know, uh, women in the, in, the, in the space that might be deciding, hey, look, is this, you know, something that I should be playing into, right? Or I'd be more in the creative side, right? You coming from this strong background, right? What would you, what would you be your recommendation in terms of, how do they decide if they should be learning JavaScript specifically or learning Python or a combination of both or, right? What, what would you say? And also, you know, how do, uh, if you were to do it again yourself, right? How do you avoid some of the painful parts? Because as you know, we can't sugarcoat it. It's, it's, there's a painful process in the learning. There's a learning curve, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I honestly would say probably go with Python because it's a lot more comprehensive and flexible. Like I just saw a Twitter kind of feud breaking out between Python developers and JavaScript developers where somebody pretty much stated that exact thing they said, you know, I, uh, JavaScript is just like you're building web apps, but Python has a lot more flexibility because you could do data analysis and, and like way, way beyond just like building a web app application, right? So the, I, I agree with that sentiment. I know that I could be, it is controversial. Like I said, this tweet had like all kinds of responses to it from both sides of the, the coin there. But um, I, I agree with that thought that like you have a lot more flexibility with Python. Um, and I haven't the even learning. dipped into the data science aspect. That's something that I really want to get into, but I just, that's the biggest learning curve for me, I would say. Mm. Um, so that, that's one thing that I definitely want to try and learn more about. Yeah. And I, and I had those, those, those battles and those discussions with David Saltimano, which you, you probably know as well, because he comes from a JavaScript background and uh, we're planning a webinar with them as well. And uh, I think, um, yeah, they're, you know, in, in reality, they are gen, they're general purpose languages. So they're, you know, in theory, capable, capable of doing the same thing. So most of the same things, just how easy or hard it is 
to do certain things in one language versus the other. Data science is a lot easier to do in Python because you know you have a bigger community packages and, and processes and documentation and help in Stack Overflow than in JavaScript. But, but if you have to do, for example, browser automation, you can do the browser automation in Python, right? You know, but it, you know the browser is mostly JavaScript engine, right? So if you do it in JavaScript, it's a lot easier. But in terms of the learning curve, would you agree that it's a lot easier in a, in a, in Python? Or you think that you learn Python a lot faster because of the you already had the programming expertise from yes, coding JavaScript? I, I, th I don't think I can speak very well to like the learning curve for Python because mostly how I've learned it is I'm, okay, I know I can do this method or like create this type of function in JavaScript, how would I do that in Python? Like that's how I go about it is kind of like what I know from JavaScript. And so there are certain concepts in Python that I haven't probably approached correct, like in the correct way, I would say. Um, they're kind of hacky probably the way that I've done it. Cause so they get the work done, done right? They, exactly, they work, they work there. And, and tell us a little bit about your journey on Python specifically. What was your approach to why, you know, first of all, the motivation, why did you decided that Python was something you want to learn? When did you started playing with it? And what you built is amazing what we're going to see, right? So. Honestly, I think like, even though it's been a year and I haven't really dipped into like using pandas or any of the like data visualization, that's been what ha has wanted me to get to learn it. Um, but then I end up doing projects where like, I know, like, I know that I can build this thing, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do that versus like some of the things where it might take more learn, like more research time, like the data visualization stuff. So um, I, like my very first attempt um, was a script from Paul Shapiro actually on his website. Nice. It was for text categorization to help like help you at scale kind of like summarize copy on a page to help write um, meta descriptions. So I was yeah. working on like a large, I think we had 150 pages for meta descriptions. So I um, wanted to use that to kind of see like how the output was and if it would help us um, with our meta descriptions like back a year ago for one particular client, so. Nice, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, and, that, and, and, and that's a great example of why we're doing this and why we think that, that it's great that older people in the community are sharing their work because look where, you know, I, I talk to other, you know, SEOs in an in-house agency and they're like, hey, I learned because I saw, I wrote this article, I got this script and that got me started because it's problem is specific, right? I face the problem, right? I'm not going to do it manually if there's a script that I can use to do it, right? So that's awesome. That's, 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 that's great. So then let's talk a little bit about, oh, and, and that, what would you, so you saw the script, but do you take a course? Do you, you know, do you use a, a resource online? How do you actually learn the language that you, and, and do you recommend that approach that you take to learn it? Um, like I said, I think mine is a little backwards because I'm coming mm. from JavaScript. So I'm like, okay, I have this, this um, data type, what what are the methods that I can use on this data type? I know in JavaScript, I can do this or that. Um, so I would say uh, probably not the best, but I did start to try and do more of the data science. Um, I had started doing like a Code Academy course, but I never, oh, okay. I haven't finished it, so. It's hard yeah. to find the time. It's hard. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing when I'm trying to learn a different language. Oh, I want to learn Ruby. Oh, Ruby for Python developers, right? Or if I want to learn the latest JavaScript versions, you know, you know, Python for, you know, JavaScript for Python developers, right? So you can quickly see, oh, this is how I do it in my language that I use more often. How do I do this in the, in the new language that I want to learn? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think so, yeah, um, so, it's kind yeah. of a disadvantage a little bit too, because there's mm -hmm. a little bit of unlearning that I have to do. Like exactly. there are things that don't coincide in some cases between like Python and JavaScript. So, so in that, I, I find those a little bit, those concepts a little bit harder to grasp in Python because I'm mm -hmm. having to unlearn something that I learned in JavaScript. So. 
Yeah, I know that. That that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, so let's shift a little bit to the context of the of the script, right? So tell us a little bit about the, the interesting finds feature, right? If you want to share your screen so that while you're doing that, because sure. I think you also um, you also wrote an article about it. You can walk us through that idea of what is the problem that you're trying to solve, so that we get a yes. you know the context of the script. Yeah, I um. I can show you. So um, I guess the way that the problem came about was a client mm -hmm. um, reached out because they saw a big visibility drop. They were using stat in mm -hmm. just mobile search. So desktop rankings were like pretty solid. Um, and so we dug into what we are seeing on their queries. And um, it's kind of kind of an eye chart here. But like, you can see clearly that this blue line for the interesting finds um, mm -hmm. just like almost overnight jumped. It, it went from having um, like no queries that they were tracking with interesting finds in the SERP to having like 9% or 4 million <laughs> of them. Wow. Um, so yeah, like uh, almost overnight. But, and it And the thing is that these, the feature isn't always present in the same position, right? Like mm -hmm. a featured snippet is up usually at the top of the page, right? And you might have two, so that could, um, and the way we found that this was, this was the issue was stat has a rank and then like a base rank and one, I can't remember which one, it's in the article, but um, one of them includes like SERP features and the other is your more traditional like 10 blue links, right? Mm -hmm. So we just um, looked at the differences in those on the mobile queries, mobile search queries. And um, that's where we determined that there was some feature that was causing this issue. And so we dug into the features report then here to find that just like overnight, these interesting finds were taking over. And this is an e-commerce client. Um, mm -hmm. And there was about 1700 queries, I think that we, determined we're probably being affected by this. Um, and that's where I built this script then to like run those at scale and determine if they were, if that feature was included. Otherwise I would have been like what manually search, <laughs> searching them and just like scrolling to see. Um, and even with that, that's a little bit of an issue because they only appear on mobile search, right? So, um, like here's 2020 toys and there's a map pack and, you know, videos. Sometimes you might get the, the product, like the us, surfaces. Yeah. Can you show what, do you have an example that you can show us what it looks like maybe with mobile emulation? Right? Yeah. And also so the, the if you emulate you mobile, which mm -hmm. is what the Selenium, the Selenium browser will allow us to do with Python is when you can, um, when you can actually and You did it a little bit faster that, you did it a little bit faster, the audience might not necessarily know yeah. slowly for the steps. So you first started the, you did an inspect element and then click on it, right? And then and yeah, was, just clicked on this was, um, toggle your device type. Perfect. Um, yeah. Which allows you then to you simulate a mobile devices. Exactly, perfect. Right. I have a Pixel 2, so I tend to use Pixel 2 myself, but when okay. I want to look at like iPhone or anything, I, I can do that as well. Um, and it is good to know what these options are because you actually have to input these valid options for the Chrome driver in the script right. itself. So that's where I default to mine because I know that that one's an option. Um, like yeah. this one, you might have to put iPhone 6, 7, 8. So you might have to double check on that one if you want to check right. that in Selenium. But yeah, once you get this um, refreshed to make sure that it's showing, uh, it's funny because I've been testing this yeah, as I've been building this in CoLab and this just popped up. Now it's at the top of this SERP. It wasn't at the yeah. top of this SERP like yesterday. <laughs> so yeah, I um, think what, but, what's happening yeah. is that Google is A-B testing where, where, where they get better engagement, right? So this is what we're talking about, the interesting finds feature that what it looks like. And you're saying that 
they started driving a lot more clicks when you saw that with, with their at a, in aggregate you saw that and um, a lot of times as seos we get stuck with just looking at the tools and looking at the numbers and we don't spend the time to go and look at the search and uh, and then i think it's a good practice hey look you know oh yeah things are moving up and down but you're not understanding unless you go and you type the query and see from a mobile device that you're doing here, or from a desktop device, what is happening from the end user perspective so that you can devise the recommendation that you want to provide the client. Yep. Yeah, and um, the other part that we kind of wanted to check with this, um, this is uh, the client wasn't using AMP on their like content pieces because because mm -hmm. these are content pieces like this is mm -hmm. all, pretty much all of these that we saw just from manually testing were content pieces so are they using uh, accelerated mobile pages amp and you can see like these little dots right have indicate that those two of those three that are in the main um presentation like main presentation without clicking into the, the more uh, are using amp so like do you need to use AMP to be featured in this? Um, no, you don't. Like you can see this one isn't, um, although this one is and it's from the same site. So maybe that's a little odd, but um, yeah, so we that's... also wanted to check for that as well. Like mm -hmm. what of, of those three links that are present in the main um, results page without clicking down to the, the more, which ones are using AMP? Yeah, that's awesome. And then you, what, you, what happened is that you had you know, you say, okay, what is the alternative, right? So you see this, am I going to be checking all of this manually, right? You know, every single page. And then when things change and they shift it, you know, I have to repeat the process again. And you say, okay, this is an opportunity for me to do it with automation, right? Because you were talking about how many queries you wanted to check? 1,700, a little more than 700. Exactly, that's a lot, you know. <laughs> so if you were to quantify this in time, right, in how much time it would have taken you to do this manually, right? Plus, it was not something that you would enjoy doing, right? No, no, not at all. And actually, like, I've modified my script to just, um, like, when I need to look at a bunch of different pages in, like, a list, I modified it so that I can just have Selenium open the browser for me locally. Um, this is mm -hmm. this is using a headless and collab, so we can't do it that way, but open it locally so I can just like hit back button and have all of those links already open for me. Yeah. So yeah, um, exactly. it, I just use it like pretty much every day just to manually either run like a few queries and out of a list or um, open open pages like as I'm manually like looking to optimize pages or something. So. Yeah, and, and the idea here is that this is something that you creatively came up with. You said, look, this is the problem, you know, you didn't want to wait for a tool to build this capability, right? And you're not constrained by, you know, a stat, you know, building that or not. You say, look, you know, stat gave me enough information at a granular level, but, um, you know, they don't have this capability that I need for this. And, you know, let me put it together. Just mm -hmm. amazing, right? Yeah, I, I mean, if somebody knows of a tool, please let me know. But, like, I haven't seen any, any, like, SERP feature presentation that really gets into the detail of like w allowing you to see where that it's present on the page so that's where um i wanted yeah, to make sure, sure that i was taking screenshots if i couldn't if i couldn't access like the location of the link by um by like checking the css or the classes on the page right like yeah. i added the screenshot aspect so that you could and it's good because then you have an archive right so like if you run your queries yeah. and then you're seeing that things are moving around again in like your base rank or rank again um you can run it again and have like com compare your screenshots from a month like like i said this one was a day and it's already changed the position of the um interesting finds feature so yeah. Exactly. You know, I wanted to mention that I'm sure that when Charlie uh, Data Chats, we, he watches this webinar and, you know, because you provided a script, he's going to put together a screenlet app in no time. You'll see that happen soon. <laughs> so that's That'll great. That'll be great. <laughs> okay, great. So, so yeah. So, and what did you learn when you, when you did this, uh, you know, when you run this uh, with your client, what new, new information you were able to gather that you didn't know before? Um, I think really the biggest thing that we were worried about was um, 
I think with e-commerce clients, because when I was in-house at e-commerce, I had the same issue. You always have this battle of like, do we invest in content, right? Like, do you have the time to invest in content? And so I think this was just a clear example of like, you need to, to start like having a better presence on some of these queries now. Like the, the, um, this feature is only using content. And for the Mm -hmm. most part, um, it was a matter of like, what, what, uh, links are there. And overwhelmingly it was like content pieces, but um, I think like 33% of them had a USA Today article. <laughs> so like wow. even just looking at like who are the publishers that are getting these, right? That, that's great. And you, and you, you see that the, the traffic was converting or was leading to conversions, this traffic to these content pieces? Because that's also another challenge with e-commerce is, okay, this mm-hmm. e-commerce driving a lot of traffic, but you know, you know, typically you've been in houses the conversion is very challenging to get content on the commerce site to convert. But in some tests, if you remove it, it might not, it might not be indirectly attributed to the conversion, but I might, might be impacting the conversion down the line because it's not an immediate conversion, but it's assisting mm-hmm. conversions because now people are aware, aware of the site and you can yes. pull them back through other, you know, even with remarketing, retargeting, you can use for that. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that is the thing that, I was finding and um, even just like a couple of the examples that I put for um, running this script and collab, it's very much like the investigative commercial intent. So not like, I'm not ready to buy, I'm like looking to buy. So a lot of those things like best, whatever, or like popular, whatever, those where you're like researching, but you're not necessarily ready to buy right now. So yes, you're right. Like, if we can get them on the site at that and then can retarget them um, with those specific yeah, products collect, later. Yeah, exactly. Even collect emails because a lot of times e-commerce sites are a little bit lazy in terms of collecting emails mm-hmm. from the traffic, right? All is, oh, let me just, the catalog, let me get the sales. But I said, look, there's a lot of people that are not ready, but you capture them in your email. And also when you, when you capture the emails, understand what type of, if it's a commercial email, like you're sending offers and or it's an email that you're trying to you know, provide educational content you're publishing on the site and then gradually pushing them into the into the commercial email list when you're sending them offers once they're express interest on in that. And um, yeah. looking at this from like a non-SEO perspective, although like adjacent to that, if you are doing um, like, outreach to um, affiliate, like affiliate outreach. This is Mm -hmm. another tool that you could use for that as well. So like my, who, what publishers are getting pulled into these interesting finds on product, like products related to my company, right? Yeah, exactly. So now, you know, Hey, I'm reaching out to you to, because I know that you're already showing up for the stuff that I care about. Brilliant. It's really, really good idea. That's awesome. So yeah, let's get to the to the to your your masterpiece. <laughs> your call that notebook right. and walk us through it. Great. So um, you definitely pushed me to like get this working in collab because I do everything like locally, and mm-hmm. when I've used Selenium, um, I run it where it'll like open the window and I can see the window and interact with it. So that that was um, very worrying for me to put it in here, but um, we did get it working. So this first code block here, um, you just run that in order to be able to install Selenium. This isn't a library that's like built into Colab, right? So we have to install it. Um, And then um, to make things a little bit easier so you're not having to write, to input like a list of um, like an array or anything like that, um, you, I've set it up so that we um, can upload a CSV file. Um, so like if you save your collab notebook, let's go back to that here for a second. So um, like save a copy in Drive, save it for yourself. That will create in Drive a collab notebooks folder for you. So then what I'm asking you to do is for the sake of this test, Um, Just add another like new folder and create one called interesting finds and then upload 
a queries.csv file. So this just has, um, I think we can preview it right in Drive. Um, I just have like five queries in here just for the sake of testing. Of course, it doesn't want to <laughs> open for me, but um, yeah, like just an Excel spreadsheet or um, and then export it as a CSV. So then now that you I can download it, you want you can download it and open it so that the audience can see what it looks like. Yeah. Now I remember I have to do the merge your pull request with the latest changes we reviewed yesterday. Let me make sure that the guys have the latest version. Actually, I actually probably version. have this on my drive already. So let me pull that yeah. up. Um, so I'll merge that pull request and share the link here. Okay. So here is. Okay. Here's what this file looks like. Um, now it's going to take forever for Excel to open for me, I imagine, but um, we'll get that. And then. Um, yeah, I'll so share the link on the chat so that you guys have the script here. Um, So yeah, I just have the, you can see the Excel spreadsheet, right? Yeah. Just and then they can just put whatever, few. yeah, they can put the full list of what they get from the stat or search console, whatever they, they have the full list that they want to expect, right? Yes. And like I said, I wanted to kind of test um, the theory that these are a lot more like of that commercial investigative intent. Um, mm -hmm. So, like usually kind of broad, broader terms, right? Yeah. Not ready to buy, like I'm looking for this specific headset, right? Not like that. Um, those you probably will see instead the more e-commerce heavy feature of the like the Google surfaces, right? Popular products. Um, but yeah, so getting back to that, um, with that file then in Google, like uploading your file to Google Drive and calling it queries.csv, um, knowing that it's saved in Colab notebooks and then interesting finds, um, you can mount your drive. Uh, I already went ahead and did this. So this is where the output's saying mounted at content G drive. So you can see that here and I have my drive and I won't open it because it has like a million other folders <laughs> that'll just clutter yeah, the screen for you. Um, but I do room? have it here. Um, just to show you my drive, collab notebooks, interesting finds, queries. Yeah, you might want to mention that the main reason why you want to mount the drive is because uh, the the collab the runtime is ephemeral, so it's not it's only going to be for a, a short period of time. If you are not persisting the work in Drive, you might lose it. You know, which yes. for me it happened. I was doing something yesterday, or I forgot to connect Google Drive and save the the work on Drive, so you don't lose it. Yes, and I will eventually have to come back because it was another test of my abilities to, to refactor this into Colab and I did not get it in time for this, was to try and, and export to Google Drive. So I didn't get that. So instead I'm just doing a download of the zip of a zip file that we create here like locally in the notebook, right? Okay. Um, well, learning, so that's a learning, learning experience for everybody. Yeah. Um, so then uh, like next, uh, once we have the, you can see the drive once you've got it where it's mounted. Now in that process, the output will say like you need to authenticate and it'll provide a link. So you click that link and it'll give you an access token and you just input that into a field within, the, within this output um, here. And then once that's authenticated, then it'll mount, say it's mounted and where it's mounted. And you can check that here. And then um, now we're gonna import all of the libraries that are kind of baked into uh, or that we installed previously by installing Selenium. Um, so we've got that run. And then the next step here, so when we were looking at this search results page and went into the dev tools and did the mobile emulation, that's what this next block is doing. Um, and I wanna point out that when I was testing this, I tried just 
like minimizing, you know, kind of like a responsive browser just by setting like the width and the, and the height. And that is not enough. Like it has to emulate in this format, at least on Chrome driver. I'm not, I didn't try like Firefox's driver or anything. Um, so this is where inputting that name of the device, um, as I mentioned, like when you're mobile emulating in the dev tools, you have that drop down option of names. Um, yeah, you, could, that's awesome. you could probably also um, Google like the Chrome driver options. And, and although I found that other website isn't like that helpful, like maybe not so. Um, then this is just, um, like I said, we're running this headless. Uh, so that means that it won't pop up the browser for you to be able to view it. And that's why when I run it locally, I like, I don't include that so that I can like go back and visually look at things and interact with it when it's done running. Um, so this is just going to run behind the scenes, no like actual browser visible to you. And then, um, at the very end here, we're just going to claim, you know, define. I'm, I'm calling this the browser, so that that's what we'll refer to it in the rest of the script. Um, and then this next part then is uh, where we have, where we're going to export our, we'll put our outputs. So we're going to create a CSV file that will show the query name and then it will also sh uh, do true or false if a interesting finds feature is present on the search and then if it is present it will have an array of well a json um, array of objects i should say that has the the um the link and then um the like yeah the name of the link essentially like the three of them and then uh we want to uh, like open a uh, file, to, a CSV file to write that data into and save it in this folder that we will then at the end zip and, and download along with our screenshots. Uh, let's make sure I ran that. I think I did. Okay. And then um, this is now, this block is going to open and read our queries.csv file. So that's where just um, if you didn't want to save it into like your collab notebooks, this is where you would just need to update this row to wherever you have it in your drive um, saved. And if you change the name to something else, like make sure that's updated as well. And then um, finally, this block is where we're actually going to like use Selenium. So now I said we'll call it browser. Um, so get, go to google.com and then I'm setting the window size, even though that doesn't, isn't enough to run like the mobile, like to get that mobile SERP environment. Um, I, I do that because I need that length set so that I can properly pull all of the screenshots for the whole page further down in my script. Um, so if you do change that to a different browser size, um, just know that you will have to update your math down here in the screenshots portion. So have fun with that. Um, but yes, so once we've got um, the browser running and it's on Google, we are going to then loop through each query. So this whole block here is our um, for loop. And I, and I did want to note, like, you, if you are worried about violating terms of service with Google, you could probably just um, start at this portion here within the for loop, and this will only pull the screenshots. So you're not like pulling actual link data from the, uh, the SERP, if that's of a concern to you, because that could violate their terms of service. Um, but yes, so running this, we will see now um, our output, like it's running our best face masks. And now our next query is bourbon and so on. Do you want me to kind of walk through, like this section is really just looking for um, the different elements on the search results page and defining like, is this an AMP link, yes or no? If, if the feature that exists, what are the three links that are on it and which of them are AMP? And that's what will be output into that um, array of objects on our 
output CSV. Yeah, so because that that part is 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 it's a little bit complicated and scary. I want you, I want to understand the process. How do you put it together, right? So sure. because everybody can approach complexity in different different ways. So how do you break out your you know? Do you write it down in a, in, a, in, a, in a document, the logical, you know, or do you did everything in your head or you did it in pieces? My approach is that when I have something complex, I piece it out and try every single thing, you know, separately. When I have everything working individually, then I start assembling them and testing again and assembling and testing them again. Yes. And at the end, you know, you get the piece. Yeah, I would say that um, really to build this whole loop, I really just started with um, making like, here's like the first thing, right? Print, mm -hmm. make sure that it's getting all of the queries in my queries.csv. Exactly. So just print those. Um, and then uh, it's a matter of um, testing. So what this is doing, um, Selenium here is find element by name. And Q is where you input your search query into Google. That's what their their name of that field is, Q. Um, and so this kind of block, I just had to build together and it's all Selenium functions, right? So um, find the element, uh, return, like hit return, <laughs> uh, send keys is like, is typing in the keystrokes and what should I type in? Um, so mm -hmm. I really built all of this together and this was um, all like a, a learning curve and just looking at Selenium documentation to do that. Um, this was yeah, an and addition. If, oh, and yeah. if you guys have questions, feel free to start, you know, posting them so we can go some with some of these questions that yeah. you might have as we're looking through this. Yeah. This, this was something I probably found in Stack Overflow. Um, mm -hmm. This was just to make, this is essentially saying like, make sure that a element far down the page, which this bot stuff is an ID that's on search results pages at the bottom. Um, so this is basically saying like, make sure the DOM has loaded before you start trying to find these elements down here. Um, so that's what that does. And then, yeah, this uh, whole portion is, you know, just looking at the search results page. And this is where um, locally I would have the browser visible instead of running it headless so that I could go in and, and inspect the elements on the page to determine the um, CSS selectors. The selectors, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And would you say that this, you visualize it a lot easier because you can see how you could do this in JavaScript as well, right? In JavaScript, you do a lot of dumb, you know, navigation and you can, you're very familiar with select, you know, yes. finding elements by their, by their classes or their IDs, right? Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that it's necessary for Python too. Like, mm -hmm. even though this is Selenium, like even before I was using Selenium, you do a lot of that with beautiful soup, right? The, exactly. um, and and pull, yeah. extracting data from that as well. So um, yeah, and so we're yes, talking about if you're selenium. just getting started, learn how to use CSS selectors for sure. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And we're talking about Selenium, but we didn't introduce it. Selenium is a browser automation library. So Selenium allows you to basically manipulate the browser any way you want. And, and originally it's used by QA teams to simulate user behavior in the browsers in automated testing. So but we're using it for SEO as well. It's cool, good, good stuff. Yeah, you wanna to get to the next block and see how you're, sure. what you're doing once you get the screenshots. Yep. Um, so like I said, if you don't want to like scrape the actual links from these and just wanna do screenshots, um, you could start, you could get rid of everything from here up to this comment of start screenshots. Um, and so this is where, uh, as I was saying, we have to um, change the math. If you change the um, browser um, that we set up here, we set the browser window size. So if you change that, you would have to change the math down here to coincide with that a little bit. So this is just looking at, um, uh, I grabbed, I claimed the body. So I've set a variable for the body tag. 
And then I'm using that down here to determine how long the height of the body is. And then um, mm -hmm. while the body hasn't reached the final scroll depth, so the, the body minus 500, then, yes. um, then it should continue doing screenshots. Oh, that's really quick. So you're scrolling the browse, you're scrolling and screenshotting. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll get like this really long, like you could either have a really exactly. long one. And it's I actually long. tried to use a Python library, um, but it, it was like clipping at a really odd time. So I ended up just writing it myself. So, yeah. That's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. And then um, you get the shipping. Yeah, the end, you know, that's taking the screenshots. Let's see what they look like when they run, right? Yeah, so I forgot to kind of mention like once we've, um, when we were up there and like creating our output file, like this is what it created over here is this interesting finds folder inside of this content um, folder. So now that it's run this loop, we can see we have all of these PNG files and, um, and you can kind of see here how um, they were saved is that uh, they're saving to the file that we create, the directory that we created up there called interesting finds. And then the image name is using the query um, and we've just replaced any spaces with a dash. And then we've also added the clip number so that, you know, depending on how long the page length is, it's gonna have multiple screenshots. So um, you'd start with the one without any number and that's gonna be the top of your, um, search results page, so voila. And then, um, you know, now I'm, not, I'm using the index on that and that would be our next one. And here's our interesting finds right here. So, um, so yeah, yeah I then- the, they, I discovered that they had that viewer, you know, just a couple of days ago. You just click on the file and you can see them, right? Yes. And it um, also let you do, so there's our output output CSV. So this has um, a row. Oh, you know what? It's not done because I haven't finalized this block, which needs to close it. So yeah, so let's close our CSV. And then um, it's going to start zipping everything up, but we should still be able to see our output here. So once we've closed our, our um, writer, our CSV writer, now we can see the results here. So. So yeah, so here's the objects. Um, yes, interesting finds is present on this query in mobile. And these are the three links. And you know, yeah. this one's not AMP, this one's not AMP, but this last one was, right? And then yeah, here we have, um, it just went ahead and zipped everything up and I can uh, show you all now. I have it here in my file explorer, all of things ready to extract into wherever I want to save it. And like I said, it's great because then you just have an archive of what the, the the search results look like. So even if you're not looking specifically for interesting finds, it's just a really cool way to easily have like an archive of what the, the SERP look like. Exactly. And the, and the best part is that you didn't have to do it, right? So you take everything for you, right? Mm -hmm. Let's open the first one where you have the scrolling, right? Whole, the whole set thing will be we should see this yeah right? i don't know if it's gonna let me because i haven't extracted my zip files yet um oh, give me a second okay. i have another that's already open here so let me uh pull that up i think here we go so yeah um that is the that's top awesome. which surprisingly there's no ads I uh, find that surprising um, at the top there, but then um, here's the second one in that series. So kind of, like I said, when I was trying to use a already built Python library for clipping, um, it was clipping like it would miss half of the, the results. So I wanted to make sure that we were kind of overlapping. So it does have the bottom of that last clip in there as well. Yeah, so we can review it offline and, and see if it if there's a lot. I've, I've done a little bit of this. Um, and this works, works great. 
So yeah, this is so so pro, so now what do you do with this once you have it, right? How do you turn this information into actionable recommendations for your client? Right. Yeah. Um for them, like I said, they were kind of interested in because they also do um some like influencer and affiliate like outreach like that. So they could look at publishers that were mm -hmm. showing up on their queries in these interesting finds to say like, hey, you know, do a product feature for us on this product in your next list. Cause most, a lot of these are like, like the toys especially is like, what are popular toys for this season, right? So a lot of those kind of like affiliate link list type of content. Um, so that was probably the biggest thing for them. And then just having like a date, the data to know, like, um, I think it was about a third of the links, the total links were AMP. So is that going to be enough to make the case to push them into implementing AMP on their content pages? Yeah, no, oh, that's awesome. That's great. Ama amazing. So, so um, this is great. So let's see if we have some questions uh, from the audience, right? Didn't get questions here. Um, but yeah, so what I did in the, in the chat, I posted the, uh, the latest version of this script of the notebook. And, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's great stuff, right? So how do they um, tell us a little bit about Upbuild and, you know, how they can, you know, connect with you or any projects that you want to bring awareness of? You mentioned, you know, uh, uh, you were doing some coding projects for, for, uh, for girls and, um, yeah, how do you got, yeah. have any, any URLs that you want to share? Um, no, like right now i'm kind of digging into um ways to help like categorize urls so i've been looking at um spacey.io i don't so yeah just like trying to find a, a good um i don't know that i want to build a model necessarily so maybe just like rule good rule based um libraries yeah. for creating like a, a categorization so yeah, do you take their NLP course? It's amazing. Uh, Ines is uh, one of the founders. She's brilliant. You know, she's given a few talks. Check out her talks. Uh, Space is an amazing library. I think they released the latest version with this has a lot of power with transformers. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, it looks like maybe somebody had a question about running this for like a high number of queries. So really just like adding more queries to that queries.csv file, just each row of that um, spreadsheet, but comma separated file. Um, and then I will warn you though that with running it in CoLab and it being headless, you could run into um, Google saying, hey, are you, are you actually a person or are you a robot? And so with that, they'll ask you to do their nice little, like help them um, determine if this the is a bridge or whatever, right? Like you have to do your CAPTCHA. So if you hit that, then your script will stop running your queries. Um, so it's, it's good then that you have like the tracking here to determine like which ones were running when it stopped. Um, yeah. And then you can pick up from that on the list if you do hit that. Yeah, so I, I think that the, the challenge, Jason, with running with, with a, lot of, a lot of queries is that, you know, it's again, the TOS on Google to do that. And um, there are services not mentioned here that I know David had uh, introduced me to uh, services like SERP, SERP API and some services that they, you know, provide a shield, a legal shield that they, they take the responsibilities of the scraping and with small changes using those APIs, you can accomplish similar with taking the screenshot for Selenium. Um, and, um, but you know, those are paid services. You have to pay for their requests and everything. 
right? But if you're if you want to do this at large scale, this is more for a smaller number when you're doing an investigation, right? That you're running, you can run it on your computer, you can run it on your on, on collab. So this is not an approach for doing this at large, you know, like a large scale, like on stat or CMR stuff right after that. You're doing it in a massive number of, of, of keywords. You have to use a service like that that they can use. Typically they use, you know, a, a farm of proxies to be able to overcome the, the protections that, that the search engine is using place. I think I ended up so of the 1700 queries that I was uh, assuming from the stat um, data were affected by interesting finds, I think I batched them to like a list of 500 maybe um, and ran and then ran them in that like amount. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, not, that's an interesting alternative. Yeah, so does that answer your question, uh, Jason? Make sure that we... How that help? And then, uh, and, then, and and yeah, you, you uh, Danielle, you want to share your your contact information, your your Twitter handle, and stuff like that, so that people can also sure. Um, um pro, you know, ask more questions about the script. Yeah, and it's in GitHub. You know, you can actually also open issues and questions in GitHub as well, right? And tag Danielle on that. So, but I hope you guys find, found these really useful. I thought it was really interesting and exciting. So. I will uh, drop good. these into the chat then. Um, if you wanna ask questions after the fact, here's how you can reach me. Amazing. Oh. Here we go. So amazing. Uh, so you know, you, you've been awesome. We're a little bit minutes uh, past, but this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, not sure if you wanted to, to mention anything else, but we're really glad that you make the time for us here. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, including me on this. This is fun to walk through and challenge myself by putting it into collab uh, versus running it locally, like I always do. So. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Great. So, so yeah, so have a great weekend and hopefully everything turns out great with the election and everything here, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So we, we, we'll be posting the, the video uh, soon. I don't know if Brittany's going to be able to do it today, but latest, you know, over the weekend, we'll have it live. Okay. Have a good Bye. one. Thank you. Bye.